founder fans, Jason here, and today's founder is John Dickinson. I have a new haircut and a very special guest, Dr. Jane Calvert is back to talk about Dickinson. Dr. Calvert, thank you so much for coming back. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, last time you were here, for a quick recap, we talked about the importance of John Dickinson as a political celebrity leading up to the American Revolution. But once we get to the Revolution, despite him writing just all the important documents, he does not end up voting for the Declaration of Independence. Well, I should say voting to declare independence. Could you comment a little bit about why he would have made that decision? Well, so it's it's pretty complicated, as you might imagine. Um, so there, there are several reasons. He actually gave a speech um, uh, before the vote, um, explaining, kind of reiterating a lot of the things that he had said over the last you know, even, you know, 10 years and, and, and more recently. Uh, and, you know, some of these things were very pragmatic, like, look, we're not ready. You know, we don't have any, um, you know, we have very limited uh, munitions. We don't have much of an army. We don't have any foreign support. You know, we just are not ready yet. So that was a very pragmatic reason. But, um, you know, he thought, uh, well, he also, you know, with his Quaker background, though he wasn't a Quaker, he, he thought that uh, the, the conflict could be solved without bloodshed, and so that was a big concern of his as well. Um, but um, I think one of the things that I've, I've kind of come around to over the last few years is kind of realizing um, what he was thinking about rights. And, you know, of course, we all know the, you know, the, the statements of rights in the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, yada, yada, yada. Well, I mean, the problem is that um, it was very clear that in America, not all people were equal and they were making greater strides towards that ideal actually in England. And so, you know, Dickinson, and I think he was thinking like, look, you know, um, the big issue we have in this country is slavery and the, the, the Southerners, they're not about to give up their slaves. I mean, look, the declaration was written by a Southerner, a slave owner. And um, and he was, meanwhile, looking back to Britain and Britain in 1772 uh, had declared slavery to be incompatible with the common law. And I think that Dickinson was kind of hoping, as the Southerners were fearing, that Britain may well enforce, you know, uh, uh, anti-slavery measures in America. And so. Uh, that and and also um, you know the, the treatment of other sort of what we would call subordinated peoples, sort of women and and Indians and uh, you know the, the sick poor and the criminals. You know, none of these people were treated very well in America, and he had ideas for how they could be treated better. And I and and I think that he thought that basic American rights might be better protected if we stayed as a, a, a within the British constitution. And one other thing that he was actually very, um, very mindful of was that in Pennsylvania, which was controlled by Quakers, uh, there was a, 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 a sizable faction of um, very angry frontiersmen who were generally Scotch-Irish Presbyterians, and they had a longstanding grudge against the Quakers for not providing enough defense against hostile Indians on the frontier. And so the Quakers feared, and I know Dickinson feared, that if the, the, if the British government went away and the Pennsylvania Constitution went away, who would protect the Quakers as dissenters? Because Quakers had always been marginalized and, and persecuted. And so they feared that you know, if, if the, the, the Presbyterians got control, they would persecute the Quakers. They were also afraid that if you know uh, the, the Pennsylvania Constitution went, went away and Anglicans, as a, as in England, gained control, then the Anglicans would persecute the Quakers. So they wanted to, things to stay status quo with Pennsylvania being protected under the Pennsylvania Constitution. So if the if the you know if if America broke from Britain, the Pennsylvania Constitution would go away, and that's exactly what happened. So you know the the the. Uh, John Adams motioned that uh, the governments that were not friendly to revolution ought to be replaced. And sure enough, there was kind of a peaceful coup d'etat in, in, in Pennsylvania where this like revolutionary government took over and Quakers were immediately you know, persecuted 
and eventually uh, all the leaders in in the state now the state under the you know um, uh, during the revolution they were rounded up and held denied habeas corpus and basically were detainees for um, uh, for many months and some of them died many of them lost their livelihoods and and then there were also Quakers who were targeted for execution. Um, and it, it was br very brutal treatment. And Dickinson and the Quakers saw this coming a mile away. Right. And I think that was one of the one, one of the reasons they thought it would be better if we worked a few things out before we just broke from Britain. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. There's a lot to unpack. So, <laughs> so there is I, a lot to unpack there. Yeah. yeah no, that's uh, first of all, I've never really heard it phrased uh, uh, the the idea that Britain might be better for the rights of marginalized people as one of Dickinson's ideas, uh, which is interesting because it reminds me, when you're reading the, the, about the revolution, you often hear the revolutionaries talking about their rights as Englishmen, uh, you know, that they, they thought Great Britain was the freest, uh, most liberty-filled nation in the world, and that's what made them so upset when their freedoms and liberties were being denied. So that's a really fascinating point that he thought Britain would do a better job of spreading those very liberties. Well, so right. And so by the time of the Declaration of Independence, the, the, the concept of the rights of Englishmen was pretty obsolete at that point, because that's kind of where they, they sort of started. And then they worked their way around to, you know, natural rights, sure. right? Um, you know, rights of man. But, uh, but then I think Dickinson Thinking in Quaker terms was actually one of the first people to start thinking about the um, human rights. So not the rights of English men, not the rights of man, but human rights. And so when he drafted the Articles of Confederation, which was, of course, our first constitution, he, he did the first draft. And in that draft, I don't think we talked about this last time, but in that draft, um, he actually um, wrote a significant very long clause in there for the protection of religious liberty. Now, when he did that, he started out writing it, um, saying like, no person shall be molested in the practice of his or their religion. But then in his draft, he crossed out his or their and wrote his or her. That is the first time that uh, gender inclusive language appeared in any Anglo-American constitution in a fundamental right. And so when Dickinson wrote, you know, no person shall be molested in the, in the, in the practice of his or her religion, the word practice was also very important because for Quaker women to practice their religion meant to speak publicly. So this was not just for women to have religious liberty, it was for women to have the freedom of public speech, which was unheard of in any circles but Quakers. That's so amazing. this was Dickinson as 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 Abigail Adams was sitting there writing to John Adams saying, "Remember the ladies," and and he's like saying, "Oh, you're so saucy, right. you know. We don't <laughs> need the despotism of the petticoat." And and you know if if Dick, you know he said, you know, if I had such a wife, it, John Adams said, if I had such a wife and such a mother, I should have I would have shot myself. Right. There was Dickinson actually writing in rights for his wife into the next constitution. Remembering the ladies. Remembering the ladies, yeah, and um, of course, none of his provisions in you know that were very sort of forward-looking made it into actual uh, articles of confederation that were ratified. So. No, uh, I was that that was going to be my next question. Is uh, you know obviously he presents the draft and then gets taken removed from the Continental Congress, uh, and then it, so these provisions that he was forward-thinking on don't end up making it. Of course okay. not. <laughs> no, of not course yet. not. So they all, uh, they were all uh, the religious liberty clause, the clause, you know, with women. Um, and he, he queried about slavery and whether that should be illegal. Um, he wanted, you know, protections for Native Americans, all that stuff ripped out of it. So uh, very interesting. Uh, moving a little bit forward, uh, Dickinson ends up, as we said last time, he ends up going and being a part of the, the war. He joins the war effort. Uh, and then sh shortly thereafter becomes governor of Delaware. And then also simultaneously Pennsylvania. Could you speak a little bit about how he came into 
both of those positions and why it w might have been possible for someone to hold both. Well, okay, so um, he had a foot in, you know, both places because Delaware had been a part of Pennsylvania. So he really, his business was in both, both colony, well, they weren't separate colonies, but, you know, both states and long, deep ties. So um, he actually, um, he got really fed up with Pennsylvania politics after, you know, his, his experiences in the assembly and then being ousted by, you know, while he was on the front, on the front you know, waging war, he was ousted from, uh, from the assembly of Pennsylvania. And then he, was, he went back in, um, he was voted right back in, but then he abdicated his seat because they refused to amend the constitution. So he left there, he was pretty disillusioned and he actually didn't want to be governor of Delaware, um, uh, but he he was he was elected to the executive council, and then he was unanimously elected to be president or governor. And uh, he th there was one dissenting vote, and it was his. Um, why? Why? why wouldn't he want it? Well, you know, I think you know he. I, I'm not exactly sure, but he he felt that it just wasn't what he wanted to be doing at the time. And um, the state was, it was, it was failing. Under Caesar Rodney, it was just, it was run into the ground. Nothing was working. And so in the year he was, he was president, he completely turned the state around. He revamped its judicial system, its econ economy, the military, um, everything. And so he turned it from a failing state to a model state. Um, and so, you know, Pennsylvania was falling into the same situation. And, you know, they were people of Pennsylvania were kind of sick of the radicals and everyone knew that Dickinson was, a, you know, a leader and a moderate. And so he was voted, you know, at, while he was president of Pennsylvania, I mean, president of Delaware, he was voted in as president of Pennsylvania. And he held this, the, the two posts about six, three months simultaneously. And then he resigned his, his position uh, in Delaware and spent three years as the president of Pennsylvania. He couldn't do much there because he was only the head of an executive council and they just kind of, you know, he didn't have a lot of latitude to, you know, to enact policies. Right. So it kind of, you know, gimped along, you know, during his time and, and lots of upheaval and, and problems. But, you know, John Jay actually said, you know, if Dickinson can't turn Pennsylvania around, it won't be his fault. Really? <laughs> so, yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, you know, um, it's funny because you had alluded to it earlier when we were talking about the Article of Federation, uh, or the Declaration, I should say, how the state uh, would have to write a new constitution. And then he leaves and comes back in that new constitution there. And it's the Pennsylvania's first constitution is kind of semi famously not great. <laughs> it was terrible. It was just a unicameral legislature, right? It, well, it was a unicameral leg legislature, but that had always been the case. That wasn't anything new. Right. Pennsylvania had all, always, almost always had it since since 1701. It had a unicameral legislature, so that was that was not new. What was new was that the Constitution no longer protected Quakers. It no longer protected you know religious dissenters um, of any kind, and um, there was this ridiculous uh, provision that um, it could only be amended every seven years. And so religious and political dissenters were being, um, uh, they were being uh, persecuted and disenfranchised. And, and the, the, that constitution was not um, changed until, I think it was, it was 17, was it 1790, I believe? Um, so yeah, it, it was still in effect when Dickinson was president. And yeah, it was, it was, not, a, it was not a good, a good situation. Uh, and you know they needed to change the un they needed a bicameral legislature and and they needed protections for dissenters and that sort of thing. Right. Not to veer too off topic, but I, I I had discussed recently that uh, as the date approached where they wanted to change the constitution, there were the Constitution Party in Pennsylvania were pro this constitution, but also anti federalist who didn't like the Federalist Constitution. <laughs> By and large, it's it's complicated. It's yes, very complicated. All these, you know, and you know, yeah, and like so, Dickinson was, you know, allegedly the anti-constitution party, but you know, he was he was, you know, a a, a federalist until until you know, um, uh, in, in until the federal government was in place, and then he was a, a you know a Jeffersonian, and so yeah, it, all these shifting names and these titles, and 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 it's it's complicated. Yeah, yeah. complicated, but it's fun. 
Uh, so yes. just, just to uh, wrap up here on that, because I'll be happy to have you back to talk more about the Constitution in particular, but could uh, when they wrote the new Pennsylvania Constitution, did Dickinson have a role in creating that, and, and what was his role? No, he, he didn't. At that point, um, he was mostly retired. I mean, he had served in the Constitutional Convention of 1787, and then his, his, his next role was as president of the Delaware Constitutional Convention from um, 91 to 92. Uh, so no, he didn't have a hand in rewriting the Pennsylvania Constitution, but he did have a hand in rewriting the Delaware Constitution. It's really interesting because the, the way you speak about it, it sounds like he almost viewed Delaware as a younger sibling to Pennsylvania, but at the same time, it sounds like he had a really heavy role in creating the state of Delaware. He did. I mean, really. And, and he considered, you know, he said um, once he said, I am a man of Kent, as in Kent County. Right. I'm a man of Kent, though not born there. So he, you know, he, he was raised in Kent County. He, he had very deep ties there. He loved it. He retired in Wilmington. Um, so, um, but yeah, I mean, I think he wasn't going to like make a name for himself in Delaware. He made a name for himself, you know, as as you know, the the, the Pennsylvania farmer, um, and Del. I mean, and Pennsylvania, of course, was a bigger state. It was going to be more consequential, and so I think that w he he had that in mind sometimes. And so, you know, once he kind of came in, fixed Delaware, and uh, you know, fixed it the first time as 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 you know, governor, and then came back and helped rewrite the constitution. So yeah, I mean, he really, and, and then his revamping of the Delaware uh, militia, he basically set Delaware, the Delaware militia up to be a model for the National Guard and, oh. and really significant there. I mean, he, he had a vision for the Delaware uh, militia as, um, as uh, what we think of today as the National Guard. Uh, so he, that, that's a significant contribution he made. Very interesting, and we probably should have uh, uh, specified this earlier. Delaware, basically until the revolution, if I'm not mistaken, was not really its own colony. It was kind of part of the lower counties of Pennsylvania. Right. So, right. Almost, it, it was it was con it was considered to be it was the low three lower counties of Pennsylvania. It was still owned by the Pens, and uh, and they just had a they had a separate legislature and a separate judicial system. Amazing. Well, Dr. Yeah. Calvert, that's about all the time we have today, although I could talk to you for hours and hours, I'm sure. Uh, thank you again so much for coming. Thank you for having me. It's it's always fun. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Founder fans, again, thank you for watching. Make sure you hit like and subscribe on your way out. Thank you to Dr. Calvert, who is just the Dickinson, uh, my Dickinson hero, so to speak. Definitely check out all of her work in the link below. She's currently writing a biography of Dickinson, has assembled his, and I'm going to get it wrong, but complete papers. Uh, and authoritative, just all the authoritative Dickens and stuff in the link. Check it out and subscribe because we're playing trivia tomorrow. Tomorrow's Friday. Come back for trivia. It's always a lot of fun. Thanks again to Dr. Calvert, and I'll be back with that trivia for you tomorrow.